Before the pioneers saw the Wellsville Mountains, mountain men were the first Caucasians to see Cache Valley. The American and European markets for pelts, from which to make beaver felt hats, was the magnet which drew trappers and traders to the Intermountain West. Beaver ponds can still be seen while one follows the Temple Fork Sawmill Trail in Logan Canyon. The foremost trapper, which is named for the largest city in Cache Valley, was Ephraim Logan. He was a Missourian who was killed by Indians. This skirmish was located today in southwest Idaho. Logan River took on his name in 1828. The valley itself was named from a French verb meaning to hide and indicated that the first American trappers checked their furs in this area. This caching or stashing is the derivative of how Cache Valley obtained its name. Various mountain men who visited Cache Valley included Jedediah S. Smith, Moses Black Harris, and John H. Weaver. Probably the most famous of these early explorers was Jim Bridger. Brigham Young sought his advice on his westward trek on June 28, 1847, while traveling with the Saints. Bridger was firmly against the idea of inhabiting the Great Basin. During a meeting, he told Young that he'd give $1,000 for a bushel of corn raised in the basin. The winter of 1825-26 was harsh enough that the buffalo that normally wintered in Cache Valley were trapped by the snows. This tragically covered the grazing areas. That spring was the last year the buffalo were present in this area, though a few stragglers were killed by trappers in 1833 when they had wandered south. On December 22, 1906, the Tri-Weekly Journal wrote about a man named Samuel Ross Kelly he reflected on his first trip here over half a century before, in 1855. He was one of the first settlers to inhabit the valley. Ross Kelly would later become a huge instrument in recording the inner workings of the Logan Temple when he would become the temple recorder. Ross Kelly penned the following paragraphs. On one of the last days of July of 1855, a little company of men and teams could be seen making a wagon trail from Dry Lake Valley over the ridge and down what has since been known as Sardine Canyon. No wagon road up to that date had been made into this beautiful valley of cash. 
Consequently, the teams were pulling them along the hillsides and crossing the gulches, the required constant efforts of all the loose men with the company. Fortunately, no serious accidents befell the outfit. Once over the ridge and down the canyon, with a large part of the beautiful valley in sight, it fairly filled the members of the company with a feeling of reverence that's easier felt than described. Hats were lifted involuntarily from the heads of owners and words escaped several lips. What a beautiful sight at beholding the broad expanse of land between the Grand Mountains east and west and to feel the inspiration arising therefrom. The winding course of Bear, Logan, and Blacksmith Fork rivers and the smaller streams flowing by willows, cottonwood trees, etc., and the land. Well, it seemed to be without limit, and the water so abundant that the New World was opened up for settlement, and it lay stretched out on the north, east, and southeast. The danger of wagons having a tip over came to an end when the company came to the bench lands, and by sunset, the creek had been reached. Hawbush Springs, located in the present Mount Sterling. Camp formed, supper prepared and eaten, and necessary guards arranged for the night. For we were now in Indian country. For although Indians who generally roamed through this valley were not considered hostile, the occasional loss of a horse and the fact that when a beef was killed in our camp, Indians were always in evidence, made vigilance. Samuel Ross Kelly. Ross Kelly escaped being here in the territory during that harsh event because he came down with rheumatism. President Young sent for a buggy which took him back to Salt Lake. Within the next decade though, Samuel Ross Kelly would return once more and call Cache Valley home and later serve as the Logan Temple Recorder. According to archivist and historian Jeff Simmons, Brigham Young had also traveled to Cache Valley that year in 1855. It was presumably to see the church farm workers and the cattle which Ross Kelly served as a joint caretaker. Later, because of a horrible winter, most of the herd was driven out of the valley and most died of either starvation or the cold. Out of 2,000 church cattle that came into the valley, 420 survived. In 1857, a group of people left Grantsville and settled in a new location in the valley. John P. Thurkel and his family moved with some of these Mormons to a place called Mons Fort, later known as Wellsville. On Independence Day of that year, a meeting was held in a bowery at the fort. Many were discouraged because their fields of wheat had recently been frozen in this new settlement. Religious meetings were the norm during this particular assembly, and Thurkel was appointed the orator. The spirit of revelation rested upon him during this time. His eyes were opened, and the future of Cache Valley was literally laid out before him. He stood up in his buckskin pants and soon started sharing what he perceived. During this event, he pointed towards Logan and said, Brethren, I prophesy that we will yet have a temple built upon that bench. The bench area could be plainly seen from Wellsville at this time. Thurkel also declared that he could see it and many other houses and thousands of people in them. He pointed out where many other settlements would be formed. He told people in that particular meeting to Press on, be diligent and faithful, and God will temper the elements for our good. Thurkel then predicted that Cache Valley would be a fruitful land, a place to be desired. He said that he could see these things and could not help but tell about it. At this time, those attending this meeting thought little of the matter after they had left. Although Thurkel had the privilege of seeing the Logan Temple almost achieve fruition, he died short of one month before it was actually dedicated in May of 1884. John Thurkel is buried in the Wellsville Cemetery near the area where he had his vision. On 
On Saturday, August 21st, 1863, Brigham Young and 12 LDS apostles entered Logan in a long train of carriages. A stream of young men and women were on both sides of the streets and were dressed in their best attire during the procession. They were celebrating the arrival of the Mormon prophet and his company. The next morning, they met in a large bowery, which was located at approximately 135 North Main, where the Jensen Haslam Architects Building is now located. Mormon Apostle Wilford Woodruff was called upon to address this Sunday service. During his sermon, he spoke particularly to the young people and counseled them to remember that day and their leaders who were present. Yea, the day will come after your fathers and these prophets and apostles are dead and gone into the spirit world. You will have the privilege of going into the towers of a glorious temple built unto the name of the Most High, east of us upon the Logan Bench. And when you stand in the tower of the temple, and your eyes survey the glorious valley filled with the cities and villages occupied by the tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints, you will then call to mind this visitation of President Young and his company. You will say, that was the days when President Ezra T. Benson and Bishop Peter Mon presided over us. That was before New York was destroyed by an earthquake. That was before Boston was swept into the sea by the sea heaving beyond its bounds. It was before Albany was destroyed by fire. Yea, at this time you remember the scenes of this day. Treasure them up and forget them not. Wilford Woodruff. President Young then stood up and declared, What Brother Woodruff has said is a revelation and will be fulfilled. Brigham Young. At the close of the 1860s, once again Brigham Young and the LDS Brethren came to Logan. This time it was at the corner of First North and Main Street where Cache Valley Bank resides today. President Young and his apostle constituents spoke at the meeting arena known as Logan Hall. Here, Young reiterated the fact that a temple was going to be built. He asked Apostle Ezra T. Benson, who presided over the Cache Valley area as a state president, to make preparations to build a road to obtain the timber in Logan Canyon. By this time, most of the timber which had been found so abundantly along the Logan River and at the mouth of the canyon had already been cut for houses and firewood. President Benson had close to 60 men who responded to his call for road missionaries. He had this project so organized that even though he died suddenly on September 3, 1869 of that year, while doctoring a sick horse, the volunteers were already organized enough to blaze the way the following month. This crew forded the streams and made a rough trail for the wagons from the place where the road ended, just a short distance from where Thomas X. Smith's mill was located. Third Dam is now the area where that mill once resided. The road then continued to Bear Lake. It took two weeks for the return trip. On June 28th, Brother Brigham came to Logan in 1873. While here, he addressed a group of LDS leaders and urged the erection of a fine temple to be built on the bench crowning the eastern part of the city. This lecture was given while on a three-day excursion with the Saints. Another main topic included finishing the railroad north to Franklin, Idaho. This quest was important because it was where a large rock quarry was located. This quarry had the necessary materials for the Logan Tabernacle and the future temple which a train could haul into Logan. 
One month later, on July 27, 1873, President Young and the Brethren from Salt Lake came to Logan once again. It was here the LDS prophet was quoted as saying, Take the people of this one valley, and they are far better able to build a temple than the whole of the saints when they lived in the eastern states. The saints did not begin to be as able to build a temple there as the people of this single valley are now. My proposition is, if you will go to work and pay up some of your back tithing, we will build a temple up there on the hill. We can select a beautiful site for one there, and we calculate to build many temples, and we will have one here if you agree to my proposition. Brigham Young. This same spirit was evidenced a year later on July 15, 1876, when Lorenzo Snow and Franklin D. Richards addressed the Cache Valley Conference at Logan and encouraged the members concerning the United Order and the building of temples. The reason for this latter admonition was that the people were being encouraged to help support the building of the Salt Lake City Temple. Previously that year, on May 6th, John Taylor, who at the time was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, had presented a letter to the church presidency. It requested that the Cache Valley Priesthood Quorums furnish men to work on the Salt Lake edifice. Later, on August 15, 1876, Brigham Young came to Cache Valley and gave a sermon in Logan. It probably took place either at Logan Hall or the Tabernacle Bowery. I have taught from the stand in this place and in other places for years the necessity of our becoming one. I can say to the Latter-day Saints, you have never heard Brother Brigham make a demand on your property. All I want to see is this people devote their means and their interests to the building up of the kingdom of God, erecting temples and in them officiating for the living and the dead, and to be instruments in the hands of God, bringing up from their graves those who have slept without having had a privilege of receiving the gospel, that they might be crowned sons and daughters of the Almighty. Brigham Young. On October 8, 1876, the first official announcement finally came during the 46th semi-annual conference of the church in Salt Lake. It was during this conference that President Young announced that the Utah Territory had been divided into various temple building districts, which were each assigned the task of erecting a temple. The St. George Temple was already under construction during this time and was almost complete. President Young said, Now I will make a proposition, and you may have five years to do the work I am about to assign to you. To the people of the Sevier Valley, Millard County, Iron County, Paiute County, Beaver County with Jewab, Kane, Washington and San Pete counties, I will say, go to work and build a temple in San Pete. Then to the people of Box Elder County, the Malad Valley, Cash Valley, Soda Springs, and Bear Lake Valley, Rich County, and the people on the Bear River, I say, unite your labor and commence as soon as you can to build a temple in Cache Valley. Brigham Young. Later on that year, the Deseret News printed an informal announcement. This gave those in the Utah Territory a heads up about the Mormon Church's plans for a temple in Cache Valley. The Northern Temple. We understand it is expected that the erection of a temple at Logan, Cache County will commence next spring. It is to be built by the people of Cache Valley, Box Elder County, Malad Valley, Bear Lake Valley, Soda Springs, and Bear River Valley. Logan, being centrally located, 
is well adapted to be the place for the rearing of such a structure, and it is surrounded by most eligible sites for a building of that character. The Deseret News. The next month, church leaders in northern Utah received an official circular December 2nd, 1876, which requested the people to build the Logan Temple. By January 17th, 1877, it was reported that donations were already being gathered for the ambitious church members in the Malad district. Malad City, we received a call today from Brother A. H. Kirk, who has just returned from a visit to Malad City, Malad Valley, Idaho. We learned from him that the saints of that place held a meeting last Saturday, at which in the neighborhood of $1,500 was subscribed to aid in the erection of the proposed temple at Logan, Cache County. The Deseret News. One month later, the Deseret News reported via a neighboring paper of the newly finished basement of the Logan Tabernacle. This event marked a major milestone. Its basement was complete enough to house about 2,500 souls to now congregate. The erection of this edifice would help the saints in the surrounding area develop skills for its future crown jewel. Dedication of the Basement of the Logan Tabernacle the basement of the new tabernacle at Logan was dedicated last Saturday, January 27th. A short time ago, we gave a detailed account of this creditable building, perhaps the finest of its kind in the territory. The Ogden Junction. This early image of the Logan Tabernacle shows it before its cupola was finished in 1885. The basement was a huge improvement over a bowery which was the main gathering place for local meetings. Now, funerals, political meetings, lectures, and conferences could be attended in an enclosed space. Brigham Young College would also be housed here temporarily from 1882 to 1884 to hear educational instructions in its basement. In March, the First Presidency posted a notice about its conference and also dedication to be held in connection with the St. George Temple. Because the railroad didn't connect to that city yet, there was a concern about lodging for the saints in that area. At the bottom of the article, it reiterated the fact that the dedication of two other future temples were drawing nigh. Soon, they would begin the erection of two more holy edifices. On April 7, 1877, local church officials were notified by Brigham Young that he expected to be in Logan sometime in May to locate a temple site. Then, on April 18th, the Desert News reported about the first conference held in the basement of the Logan Tabernacle. It had actually taken place a month previously on March 10th, but gathering news and typesetting the paper made fresh news a rarity at the time. Thus, events printed in the paper in the 1800s were not as time sensitive compared to today's standards. Among the various topics that were addressed in this conference, the future temple was included in the local brethren's agenda. A special conference was called on May 12, 1877. In Salt Lake, where in part, the Logan Temple was discussed. Mormon Apostle John Taylor spoke about the feelings he had while visiting the various saints in the territory. These sentiments and travels were reported in the Desert News. This paper also said that Another temple was soon to be commenced at Logan in Cache Valley, and thus the work of the Lord in the matter of temple building was progressing. Taylor would soon be in Cache Valley by that weekend to help aid in that commencement.
following years of anticipation, the saints from Cache Valley and the surrounding areas were finally ready to begin building the present beacon of northern Utah. On the morning of May 16, 1877, Brigham Young and other church officials boarded a train and left Salt Lake City for Logan, where they would select a site for the temple and reorganize the Cache Valley Stake. They had just finished dedicating the St. George Temple on April 6th, when the General Conference of the Church convened there. That Southern Utah Territory Temple site was consecrated to God on November 9th, 1871. The saints were a temple building community, for they had constructed two temples on the east, one in Kirtland, Ohio, and the other at Nauvoo, Illinois. They had also dedicated two sites in Missouri, one in Independence the other in Far West. Reluctantly, they left them all behind as they were forced to move westward by violent mobs. Thirty years later after arriving in Salt Lake City, Brigham Young would now lead a Mormon procession to Logan. Although sacrificing a great deal in building past temples, President Young was determined to press forward in erecting new ones. Gone to Logan. This morning, Presidents Brigham Young, John W. Young, and D.H. Wells Apostles John Taylor, Orson Pratt, Erastus Snow, F. D. Richards, George Q. Cannon, and Brigham Young Jr., Elders Truman O. Angel Sr., and W. H. Folsom, Bishops E. F. Sheets, and L. D. Young, Elder J.W. Fox and several others left this city for Logan to attend the special conference to commence there on Saturday. The Deseret News. A.J. Simmons, the late Utah State University archivist, wrote about the beginnings of the Logan Temple. Besides Mormon church officials being involved in choosing the temple site, it was also mixed as a family outing. Simmons penned. It is hard to escape the belief that the Logan Tabernacle was essentially built as a practice for the temple. For in May 1877, after spending the night with his family in the George W. Thatcher Senior Home, Brigham Young got up, took his grandson G.W. Jr. by the hand, and said, Come on, Georgie, and let's go and pick a spot for the temple and work began that same year on the Logan Temple. A. J. Simmons. James Martineau was a surveyor for Cache County during its infancy. He accompanied the Utah Territory surveyor, Jesse W. Fox, with President Young at the temple site. In his journals, Martineau tells of his frustrated perspective of laying out the temple grounds. May 16, 1877. Surveyed for Jacobson, President Brigham Young and Company. 
arrived to locate site for temple in the evening. President Young sent for me and said he wished me to assist in laying out the temple with Jesse W. Fox. May 17, 1877. Help to lay out the temple foundation. May 18, 1877. At noon today, the ground was dedicated. A cold, snowy, disagreeable day. Brother Fox laid the lines with variance 17 degrees 20 minutes east, the variance of local surveys being 16 degrees 20 minutes east, the U.S. lines 18 degrees 15 minutes east. President Young said he wished it laid out true north and south, therefore I opposed his determination, Fox's, all I decently could. I feel ashamed to be associated with such a foolish proceeding of Brother Fox's. As it is now located, the temple agrees neither with our city survey, being three feet out of line, nor within two feet of the true north and south line. I afterwards informed President Thatcher and others about it. May 19, 1877. Having informed Elder Brigham Young, Jr. in regard to the laying out of the temple, we telegraphed to the president relative to it, asking what should be done. I did not see the answer. James Henry Martineau. Nolan Olson, the former Logan Temple recorder and author of the book Logan Temple, The First Hundred Years, wrote about the temple surveying. He penned in that book the following. Brigham Young put his heel down on the southeast corner, walked 171 feet west, 95 feet north, and back to the east and south corners. He asked James Anderson and William Hyde, with four other brethren, to dig holes where the present towers are, so he could see the formation of the ground. They found it very difficult digging, and when the hole was down eight to ten feet, Brigham said, That's far enough, brethren. It is like that clear to the bottom. Years later, when the hill was surveyed, it was found that there is nothing but a solid gravel formation for over a thousand feet, just like Brigham said. Nolan Olson. Five days after the event took place, the Deseret News published an initial blurb about the Temple Grounds dedication. Dedication of the site for the Temple at Logan. Logan, May 18th. The ground site for the proposed temple to be built at Logan was selected yesterday by the first president CN12 and surveyed by Elder Jesse W. Fox, who was assisted by James H. Martineau, the architect Truman O. Angel Sr., and others. The site is most beautifully situated on a piece of tableland immediately east of the city, commanding a delightful view of the celebrated Valley of Cash. Today, at precisely 12 o'clock, the ground was broken at the southeast corner of the site. Elder Orson Pratt, kneeling near the broken ground and surrounded by several prominent elders and a large number of people, then offered the dedicatory prayer, after which remarks were made by President Young and Elder John Taylor. Deseret News Not all reporters were thrilled with the edifice that was to be built in Logan. The Salt Lake Daily Tribune wrote a scathing report about the event which Mormons revered. The site for the Prophet's new temple is within what is known in Logan as the Public Park, for which was favored, laid off in lots, and placed in a state of cultivation several years ago. It is evident from the fact that Brigham is locating his temple on this ground that he and Bishop Preston, who is mayor of Logan, have stolen this fine piece of land which was reserved for public sues. This matter ought to be inquired into by the proper offices and the thieves enjoined from erecting their unholy temple on public soil. Continuing with its rather harsh rhetoric, the Salt Lake Daily Tribune wrote, Brigham and his fellow thieves have just closed their conference here. The general three days muster of the Nauvoo Legion of Cache County, which was ordered for the 21st, or immediately after the close of the conference in Logan, has been indefinitely postponed by the president. And this muster will now turn out to be a tribune lie. The powwow, of course, could not begin until the chief man arrived. So. 
a special train left here Thursday morning and returned with its precious cargo of inspired flesh about noon the same day. The Prophet and his party were met at the depot, as in the days of yore, by the Sunday school children, the big boys of Logan, and the feeble Relief Society, who lined either side of the way from the cars to the main street. The ground for the new temple was dedicated on Friday, notwithstanding the foul state of the weather, and Apostle Pratt offered the prayer, in which he called down the blessings of God on the site, the water, which shall be conducted into the new house, and the grease, which is to trickle down the backs of the fools who enter therein. The Salt Lake Daily Tribune. The following Monday, on May 21st, 1877, the Mormon Brethren held a meeting in Logan. Henry Ballard attended it and noted what Brigham Young strongly counseled about the temple. He wanted us to go to work at the Logan Temple right away. He said he would give us three and a half years to build it, but said we could build it in two and a half years. He wanted it built as a free will offering to the Lord, without mentioning wages. He blessed the saints and started back to Salt Lake City at 2 p.m. on the train. Shortly after the dedication, which he attended, Henry Ballard wrote about it and other experiences relating to it in his journal. He was one of the first to actually work on the temple. May 28, 1877. Myself and other brethren commenced to plow and scrape out the foundation of the Logan Temple. Henry Ballard. Published more than a month later on June 20th, 1877, this rather large Deseret News tri-story article gave an excellent rundown of the local jubilant event. The highlight of that day, of course, was President Brigham Young's sermon. The faithful attending were not let down as they heard the message of their prophet. Unbeknownst to them at the time, this would be his final trek to Cache Valley. Brethren, if you will give me your attention, I will say a few words to you. We have dedicated this spot of ground upon which we expect to erect a temple, which we expect to administer the ordinances of the house of God unto this people when it is completed. And we expect to enter into and enjoy the blessings of the priesthood. This is the object of the temple which we are about to commence building at this place. We require the brethren and the sisters to go with their might and erect this temple. And from the architect to the boy who carries drinking water to the man who works on the building, we wish them to understand that wages are entirely out of the question. This may be called a temporal work, but it pertains to the salvation of ourselves as well as our friends who have passed behind the veil, and also to the generations that are to come after us. We can carry this temple forward with our labor without any burden to ourselves if our hearts are in the work, and we will be blessed abundantly in doing so. We will be better off in our temporal affairs when it is completed than when we commenced, and than we would be if we did not build it. Brigham Young. Also in that June 20th edition, it gave an update on how the Salt Lake Temple was progressing. This image of the Salt Lake Temple is around the same time period as the article was penned. It gives one an idea of how much slower and tedious the erection of that granite temple was progressing. The man centered in the middle with a top hat is believed to be Truman O. Angel Sr., head architect of the temples with his two wives, Polly Johnson and Susan Eliza Savage. Later on, his son, Truman Angel Jr., would become the assistant architect to the Logan Temple to his father, then finally take over as architect of that edifice. 
Years later, Angel would also become the architect for the Cache County Courthouse. Two months later in July, James Martineau received a reply from the Temple Architect. He had originally talked with Truman Angel Jr. about the Temple survey situation which worried him because he didn't distinguish in his journals which architect he talked to in this particular entry, one can only guess if he meant senior or junior. July 28, 1877, saw Angel, the architect, who informs me that President Young thinks best not to make any change now that much has been done. This I regret, for I believe President Young has not been fully informed in relation to it. James Henry Martineau. Also during this month, the Deseret News first published this announcement on July 11th and again on the 18th. It showed that the Saints in the Idaho Territory and the Bear Lake region were exuberant in helping to make a needed thoroughfare in the building of the temple. Within two short months, the basement region had been dug and scraped out. Finally, the masonry of the temple could get underway. This notification was published July 25, 1877. The Desert News shared a blurb on how the Logan Temple was progressing. As the walls of the Logan Temple were going up, the health of President Young was severely declining. Over the years, he would frequent his home in St. George, Utah during the winter months. This warmer climate and atmosphere seemed to lessen his health problems. But by August of 1877, his health turned for the worst and he passed on in his Salt Lake home. It was reported that he died of peritonitis from a ruptured appendix. As with many of the saints, Henry Ballard also wrote in his journal about the Mormon prophet's passing. President Young died in Salt Lake City at his home after one week sickness at 4 p.m. It cast a gloom over the whole people. Great crowds of people went to the new tabernacle to see him where he had been taken the day before. The services commenced at 12 noon. It was a great gathering. It was estimated that 30,000 people assembled on the occasion. The saints felt to acknowledge the hand of the Lord in taking away their president, although it was hard. Everything went off very orderly. He was highly esteemed by all the saints and many of the outside world, for he was kind to all that came into his company. Henry Ballard. On September 19, 1877, the saints were ready to dedicate the cornerstones of the Logan Temple. Letters were sent to all the wards and stakes in the temple district. It notified the various Mormon congregations of the pivotal event and requested their attendance. The notification paid off for thousands attended the ceremony from the neighboring settlements. A large parade of people gathered at the corner of Main and Center Streets. They then proceeded to walk up the hill and convened at the southeast corner of the temple grounds. Monday, September 19th at 12 o'clock noon, being the time fixed upon for laying the cornerstones of the temple in Logan. The following authorities of the church left Salt Lake City on Sunday per special car, immediately after the afternoon service, to regulate and take part in the ceremonies. Of the Apostles, President John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, George Q. Cannon, Brigham Young, Albert Carrington, and Councillor D. H. Wells, the Deseret News. During this grand ceremony, it can be noted that there were four 
dedicatory prayers given for each of the individual cornerstones. Henry Ballard attended the event and recorded his impressions. The cornerstones of the temple were laid. The twelve apostles laid the southeast. Bishops and lesser priesthood laid the southwest. High priests and presidents of the stakes laid the northwest and the presidents of the 70s laid the northeast corners. A very large company assembled to witness the imposing ceremonies. Eight of the twelve apostles were present on the occasion. Henry Ballard. Seven more years would follow before the final dedication would happen on the Logan Temple grounds. This would ensue in May of 1884. That historic event would bestow this structure to God. According to Mormon theology, spiritual saving ordinances could then be performed for the living. Vicarious rites could also be enjoyed for those who had transcended through the veil into the great beyond. During these next seven years, some would pass on themselves while aiding its construction. Another would have a near-death experience. These local saints all had one thing in common. These thousands of construction workers believed in a cause that would provide a place for future generations to obtain blessings from on high. These hardy pioneers worked with the conviction that the Logan Temple would and could open up spiritual gates to all of God's children. And that is what compelled them to spend their time, money, and inadvertently their lives on. Building an edifice that would help aid the spiritual pathway for the family of mankind.
Thank you.